Father, as has been prayed and lifted up before you, we just ask yet again that your Holy Spirit continue to guide us, to direct us into all truth. Give us ears to hear this morning what your Spirit says to the, your church. And let us not just be hearers only, but doers of your word. I ask, Father, that as I speak this morning, you bring back to my remembrance all the things which I have studied and keep me from away from the path of error this morning. Let me just present your word as you have presented it to your people. And Father, let us, your church, continually grow in the direction of reflecting your glory to this lost and dying generation. And let us even this morning find encouragement in these promises which you have given to us in your word that we may stand and not fall and stand rightly in, in, in faith on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to speak to you this morning um, <clears throat> from the topic or subject, if you will. It's time to cross Jordan. It is time to cross Jordan. To add just a little bit more focus to that, I've also included a subtext, which very simply states a clause from the words of Scripture, with God, all things are possible. We're going to be, of course, in the book of Joshua, the third chapter. And uh, before we get into the verses here, let me just bring you, as it were, up to speed. We're now at the point in the history of the congregation of Israel that they have come to the banks of the Jordan River after storming through Jericho. And curiously, this is not the first time that they have been at this Jordan River. Actually, 40 years prior, Moses had sent spies into the promised land of Canaan. And they came back with these marvelous, marvelous descriptions of, of the land flowing with milk and honey and, and, and you know, bringing back fruits that it took two, two, and, two and three and four men to carry. But ten of these people also reported that the land was full of giants and we are like grasshoppers before them. Ten, but there were two, Joshua and Caleb, who brought a very much different report, which said, yes, they may be giants. However, they're meat for us. We can do this. And of course, we know what happened, and I will touch on this just a little bit later, but this result in, in Joshua in particular being very scorned. Uh, and this was only because, only because of the fear of the people. As a result of this great sin before God, the congregation of Israel spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness till all these unrighteous, unbelieving group of people died off. And here we are. Moses is dead. Joshua is now leading this congregation. They are back at the banks of the Jordan with the same decision they had to make before. Will we trust and obey? Or will we lean unto our own understanding? We know how this ends, but let's get through these. Because they're ready to claim the promised land. But at this point, there is a major obstacle. God has brought them to, to crossing the Jordan at the point of Gilgal. Now, typically, typically, at this point, it is about 100 feet wide to cross. But if we look down at verse 15 in the third chapter, and we're going to get into the verses here in just a minute, um, of the fourth chapter, excuse me, it was the time of harvest, okay? And during the time of harvest, <clears throat> excuse me, this point of, this, of the Jordan at Gilgal, instead of being 100 feet wide, it swells to about 50 times or more of its regular distance. So now we're not looking at a 100 foot wide stream of the River Jordan across. We're now looking at a crashing 
rushing river that is almost a mile wide to get across. There was no way that about two million people of their own power would get across and receive their promise. Not of their own power. And, you know, I, I, I just feel that we, we too may be tempted regularly. In fact, I'm sure we are tempted regularly to have a look at impossible circumstances and wonder where is God in this? And if you have it, I'll tell you I've done enough of it for you. All right? <laughs> but thank God I've learned and I have an example. And, you know, I'm, 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 I, I so enjoy reading the accounts in the Old Testament of the congregation of Israel because they, are, they type, they shadow, they model the things that God had in store for us. They are the genetic race, physical, a physical representation of God's spiritual church, if you will. And the lessons they learn then become principles for us to either learn from or do like they say, you know, there's a difference between wisdom and experience, okay? Experience, you know, if, if there's a brick wall, there's two applications of wisdom and experience. Wisdom is someone telling you, hey, if you run at full speed into this brick wall, you're just really going to hurt. And you say, really? Okay, I guess I will not run full speed into this brick wall. That's wisdom. Experience, though, comes with a little cost. Wisdom's free. Experience is you saying, hearing them say this thing and change the subject into something else, got to go by, run full speed, and smack into the wall. Then you experience this pain of colliding full speed into the brick wall. Experience has a cost. We need wisdom. Amen. So, I'm going to hit on this multiple times, but I want to say to you this morning, Messiah Church and those listening over internet, I don't know what kind of situation that you're facing this morning. Things seem impossible, but let me just reiterate to you, with God, all things are possible. So we're going to look into this account this morning, and I have a bunch of verses, so we're just going to do a group at a time. And... Let me just frame this just a little bit. We know that God specializes in things impossible and things that are supernatural to us are natural to God. So we're going to look at what happened here at this Jordan River. And there were two things that needed to happen in order for this miracle to become complete. One, God had to stop the flow of water, which was, of course, natural to him. But two... The second thing had to happen is the people had to actually believe what he says and then be obedient and take the steps. So let's begin with our verses here. Uh, third chapter of the book of Joshua. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1, of course. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. He and all the sons of Israel set out before Shittim and came, came to the Jordan, and they lodged here, there, excuse me, before they crossed. And it came about at the end of three days that the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priest carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it, a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Verses 1 through 4, then, will be our first point. And in honor of uh, Dr. Burks, I'm going to use alliteration for all my points. So our first point this morning, then, is the preeminence of the presence of God. Now we take note that in this chapter, this third chapter, the ark 
of the covenant is mentioned about seven times and then more times as you, as you keep going through, through uh, the, the preceding chapters. Now, as you may remember, this ark was a very special piece of tabernacle furniture. Um, you know, it contained the remnants of the Ten Commandments, the pots of manna, wrote, um, Aaron's rod that had budded. And when it was in the Holy of Holies, the presence of God rested uh, over on it, over it. And the cherubim had their wings pointing to the mercy seat and what have you. And everywhere the ark went, when it was, when it was moving, being borne by the Levites, the congregation of Israel was to follow. So again, it represented the person and the promises of God. And I would offer you to you this morning, and, and you probably are well aware of this, this is a type and shadow of Christ who is the fulfillment of the ark. He is Emmanuel, God, with us. So, if the congregation of Israel was to follow the ark everywhere that it went, how much more so must we move in the presence of our present Savior and wherever he leads, we will go. All right. So, this also then was a reminder that if they were to possess the land, they must not do so in their own strength. Now, Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. This is, you don't have to, I'll just read it. But it, it, it concludes with saying, And such confidence we have through Christ towards God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Listen, there is a valuable, valuable, valuable message in every line of this, this, this book of Joshua, especially particularly here for us. When, there, when we're in the time of trouble, when we are facing crisis and it seems like we have lost direction, God will show us the way. Now, will we wait on him? Will we watch for him? Notice also, then, the instructions that were given were to stay about 2,000 cubits behind the ark. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first of which is fairly obvious with two million, a congregation of 2 million or more people. You need to be a bit of a distance away so that you could see it. Okay? But also, this is a, a, reminder, a reminder to us again about the holiness of God. Okay, we have become so comfortable in the presence of God. Believers, we have become so comfortable with the presence of God that we have failed to recall the fact that this is our sovereign Lord, our almighty King. We cannot even look in his face and live. I remember coming up and, and there's, it's still going on today just in a different form. But I remember coming up, I'd listen to all these great preachers and, you know, before they would do their sermons, they'd, they'd have these just extravagant prayers that would go forth. And, and I would always hear them directing God what he's going to do, commanding God to do this, telling God to do that. And I was just mind boggled over that. I never have to this day been able to make sense of it other than to, other than to arrive to the conclusion that they just didn't understand who God is. But this continues today. The form has changed a little bit, but it is still the same essential concept. We have lost the fear of God. We have now preachers, word of faith people telling us that our words are containers for the power of God, and whatever, if, if we just speak that, he's going to have to do it because he's bound to it. Lord, have mercy. We 
can never allow a spirit of familiarity to cheapen our walk and our relationship with God. We cannot get too comfortable whether we're serving God from the pulpit or receiving his word in the congregation or sharing his word with a lost and dying generation. We must always remember who he is and who we are. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. You know, and in, in Hebrews we read that, you know, that Aaron and Moses had to keep their eyes fixed up on the ark. But, you know, Paul goes on to say, and as, as uh, Keith mentioned this morning, you know, we have to now fix our eyes on our present Savior Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We must keep our eyes on that ark. So my second point then, moving down to verses 5 and 6, which I will read. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross overhead of the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. My second point then this morning is, Alliterated, of course, the preparation of the people of God. So we see in verse 5 that Joshua commands the people to consecrate themselves. This word is in the Hebrew is kadash, and it may mean hallowed, set apart, consecrated. But the construction in the grammar is very curious because it's presented, the stem there is presented as reflexive. So, what, so instead of like Kadash being set apart, being consecrated, it means consecrate yourselves, set yourselves apart. And, you know, this was used once before, uh, and, and this was when, when Moses was over the children of Israel and, and the command was given to consecrate yourselves, the people did two things. They washed their clothes. And they abstained from relations with spouses. So what is this about? What is this consecration about? It's about presenting yourself the right kind of sacrifice before God to the point that even in the confines of the marital relationship, something that is not considered wrong or sin was held back because drawing closer to God was placed at a higher priority. All right? So the people then needed to be consecrated. Uh, the uses also are found throughout the Old Testament, and, and we see this in, in connection with the Levitical priesthood and with mikvah and uh, generally in regard to the children of God. Also, it portrays the need to deal with sin in the life of the believer. Brothers and sisters, let me be a reminder to you this morning that we are to be light to the world and salt to the earth. But if that salt has lost its savor, it is not of any use to an unsavory world. We need to be at a constant examination of our lives. We no longer have a sin nature. It's been deactivated. So we need to be active about putting our bodies, our minds, our thoughts, our words, our deeds into subjection and bringing every thought captive that does not conform to the image of Christ. We have a role in this. We don't have any part of our salvation, but we do have commandments. If we do want to experience God's best for us, we need to be the type of vessel that he can use. Amen. The other half of part B, uh, the, excuse me, verse, uh, verse 5, part B, Joshua says, tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. 
as I said a moment ago, when there's a lack of consecration and when there's, a lack, when there's unconfessed sin in our lives, we don't experience God's best for us. But there is more included in this call. And Brother Keith mentioned this this morning. There is to be a confident expectation of the power of God on display. This is where the people began to become prepared. By number one, setting themselves apart. But number two, having that expectation, that hopeful expectation on the Lord. The same usage is found in Isaiah when he, when he, when he, he and says to wait. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. We'll mine up with wings as eagles. We'll run and not be weary. We'll walk and not faint. That is that same patient, hopeful expectation that God will do what he said he's going to do. Now, having to be consecrated and having to wait on God, as I mentioned earlier, reminds us of God's holiness. It also ought to bring to bear in our minds the absolute necessity for what Jesus lived for, his work on the cross, his resurrection, and his return to accomplish, as, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, that un unbroken chain of salvation. It is so necessary that we be products of his work. Without the faith, without our faith in Christ that, that he gives to us, we cannot actually be set apart. For his work. Let me also say this. As I mentioned a few moments ago. We need to be. The type of vessel. That God can use to demonstrate. His best. If we want to have a full experience of his power. And his protection. And his deliverance. Our hearts need to be right. We need to be in a place where we can receive from and learn of God's word. The word that comes forth, as we who teach and preach this word, when we stand here and we speak the words of God from, from, his, from his word, just, and, and we speak it in context and we speak it with all authority, you need to realize that you are hearing the Logos. You are hearing Christ. We need this. You need this. And it needs to be in all of us because there we have a mission to accomplish. We're engaging in evangelism. But we need to be evangelized our own selves sometimes. We need to hear this. We need to let this word get in us. We need to let it continue to sanctify us. Because what we're showing to the world is we're showing them Christ. But you know what else? You know what else? We're showing Christ to one another. We cannot work out the one another's that we see all through the New Testament if we don't have it in us. Amen. There are times that and I know everyone in this room can identify me with me when I say this. There are times that we cannot even pray for ourselves. I need you, my brothers and sisters, to hold me up when I'm too weak to do it for my own self. And you will need us, brothers and sisters, to hold you up. Because there will be, if there has not already, there will be a time when you're not going to be able to do it for yourselves. God has gifted the church and everyone that's part of this body, that is affiliated with this body, let me tell you something directly. I need your gifts. I am incomplete without your gifting. I cannot make it as well as I would without you. And let me turn it around the same way. You need the gifts that are placed in your brothers and sisters. God gave the gifts to the church for a reason. It is for our edification. It is for us to mature into the kind of bride 
that is fully adorned. <clears throat> Set ourselves apart so that we can cross that Jordan and into the land and then go on to become a testimony to the nations. This, plan of, this, this mention of consecration also invites the work of the Holy Spirit. And these are all intertwined within one another. But the Holy Spirit works on us and conforms us daily to the image of Christ. And as we set ourselves in a place where we can receive of the word, where we can receive of one another, where we can minister to one another this same word, guess what? Our consecration becomes more and more and more prevalent. And we become more and more and more able to be the type of vessel for God's best. Verses 7 through 13. I'm watching my time here. This point is called the promise of a providentially protected passage. Say that three times fast. Verse 7, now the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Verse 8, you shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of Jordan, you shall stand, stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the sons of Israel, come here and hear the words of of the Lord your God. And Joshua says, By this you shall know that the living God is among you. Excuse me, lost my place there. And he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. Behold the ark of the covenant of the Lord, all of the earth, is crossing over you, crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now take, therefore, take yourselves twelve men from the twelve tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. And it shall come to pass that when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. And the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. These verses here that we just read begin to break down the components of God's grace in this situation. They show us that crossing the Jordan and, and the dispossession of the land from their enemies was a work of God just as all aspects of our work of salvation is of the Lord. The things we do in righteousness for our consecration have nothing to do with our salvation. No, they make us more of that vessel that I was just talking about. But God's grace, he prepares our hearts to receive his grace So that when we put our feet in the water, we are ready to cross over and face down whatever enemies may be waiting for us on the other side. Now looking at verse 7 here. He says, the Lord says to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel. I mentioned early on what type of reception that Joshua received when he came back, when he and Caleb gave their reports. And he endured a great amount of scorn, in fact, to the fact that they wanted to stone him. <clears throat> they wanted to stone Joshua for telling them, we can accomplish what God has said we can do. Terrible, terrible sin. And I imagine that that was very humiliating for him to endure. But he stayed faithful to God. And if you remember, beginning at the first chapter of Joshua, I'll read these first few verses. God then calls Joshua. 
verse 1 of chapter 1 says, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord had spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. He can recommunicates this great promise to him. He recommunicates this great promise to him and lays the charge on him. And now here in this third chapter, God begins to reveal the leader that he's made Joshua into for these people. I will begin to exalt you in all the sight of Israel. That they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. Can that be said of us? Have we remained faithful? Verse 8. God directs the priests. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Now we remember that they carried the Ark on the wooden poles. They are commanded them by themselves to take the Ark to the edge of the banks and stand in the water. What does this tell us? It reminds us then that faith and obedience are our lot for God's plans. It reminds us then of the need to rest on God's promises. They were not of themselves to run down into the water and start trying to navigate this mile wide flow. Now let me ask you something brothers and sisters. Have you ever recalled a time that you set out to do something for God and you fell flat on your face? I will tell you this exactly 100% of the time that that has happened to me it was because I was not waiting for the ark to move. I felt in and of myself that this is something I knew I needed to do and should do right away. We got to follow our lead. You know, Jesus, and in, in especially a lot in the, in the uh, fifth chapter of the book of John says, you know, I don't do anything that I don't see my father in heaven <laughs> doing. We likewise need to be spiritually minded. We need to grow in our spiritual mindedness so that we can see the things that God is doing in heaven before we set ourselves off to do them. You know, if, if you've been given a gift to, you know, the, to, to pray for someone and, and, they, and they recover, you know, don't in and of your own self decide, I'm taking a trip down to the ICU. But at the same time, if God has told you, if you have seen in the spirit that he's directed you to do this, then you don't hesitate to do so. God directed the priests. Now here as we move into 9 through 13, these are the directions to the people. Verse 9. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. I need to stop right there. No, nope, not quite. <laughs> but let me hover over this point just a little bit. <laughs> Come here and hear the words of God. We are in a precarious situation, brothers and sisters, because there is so much I like to call garbage theology going on right now. And sadly, Tragically, churches even are promoting our participation in these things. There is a movie, another movie, 
<laughs> that's going on right now that a lot of well-meaning Christians have encouraged other believers to attend. And some of you might be familiar with it. It's called Heaven is for Real. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. It is now okay for churches to say that we're not going to look to the words of Scripture to know what God has to say about heaven. No, we're going to listen to the near-death experience of a three-year-old child. And hopefully, people will get saved. See this red mark I got on my head? That was when I was doing this. It felt good when I stopped. We need to come and hear the words of God. As I mentioned earlier, when we preach and teach this blessed word, we are hearing from God. We see that in the concept of Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. This is saving faith comes by hearing the words of Christ. So we need to be a people that seek after the word of God. And when the word is being brought forth, we need to make sure that we're here to hear it. Yeah. Verse 10, I'm skipping around a little bit, excuse me, but verse 10 reads, Joshua says, by this you shall know that the living God is among you. He had just then finished explaining to them that they are to follow the ark. It's God's presence, reminder, is what sustains us and strengthens us as believers. We need to stay focused on him. Now listen to this promise, verse 13. And it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above shall stand in one heap. Have you received a promise from God's word that you don't see how it is even possible to be carried out? I would advise you to stay tuned because we're not going to move into verse 14 through 17. Point number four, which I call the presentation of the passage by the power of God. I'm done alliterating. Thank you. <laughs> you, see, <laughs> you see, there was a problem, as I mentioned earlier. There were two million people that needed to get across a crashing river that was over a mile wide. They couldn't build a bridge. There wasn't enough time or materials to do that. They couldn't get in boats because then they would be just sitting ducks for the enemies waiting for them on the other side. There was only one way to address this problem properly, and that was to go through I used to hear a saying in church coming up that God will not bring you to something unless he will bring you through it. God won't bring you to it without bringing you through it. Are we looking at our problems from that perspective? Are we looking at the things that we are faced with with that perspective? Are we looking at impossible situations with any other perspective have mercy are we looking at our medical conditions with that perspective are we looking at our financial conditions with that perspective we all have Jordans that we're going to need to cross and they will be as different from person to person as people are from person to person. 
But whatever it may be, let me remind you. And I'm going to continue to remind you until I sit down here. And then after I sit down, if you come talk to me, I'm going to remind you. That with men, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. So now here we are. And if this were our day and time, we'd probably have Michael Buffer announcing this big, great event with his booming voice, whatever. But I guarantee you what was about to happen would have made even Michael Buffer choke. Okay? Listen to this. The priest, the Levite, stepped into the raging river and it parted. And God opened a path of dry, firm ground for them to stand on. So the thing goes from 100 miles of raging, mighty river to the priest stepping in, the flow of water has stopped. The ground has become dry and firm. And this should have brought to mind the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. Something very curious about this that was mentioned, verse 16. The waters were backed up all the way to the city of Adam. This is several miles away from where they were crossing. Let's examine this just for a second. It took God's preparation, God's design, God's complete intervention for the water several miles away to be stopped. And when the command was given for the priest to step in the water, for it itself to stop flowing. Now, what do we take from this? What do we take from this? We take from this that God's direction to us is not something to take so lightly. Because he was already involved before the children of Israel set foot in this Jordan River. Now look at our situations. Look at us. When we come up to our Jordan to cross, what are we doing? Are we panicking? Are we reverting to our old ways? cursing and screaming, fighting. What are we doing? Have we forgotten that in all things God works to them who love him and who are the call according to his purposes? He was already working the situation out before they arrived. All they had to do was obey his promise for it to come to pass. Sometimes we can't even see the provision that's being made. In fact, let me change that. I'll say most of the time, we don't even see the provision being made. <coughs> so do we put our faith in what we can see? Or do we follow the presence of God? Wherever he leads, I will go. There's also a lesson here for those of us who stand in leadership and, and, and let this be a reminder to us that when times of trouble come our way what type of leaders are we supposed to be? This, this was very encouraging to me as we know what Messiah is standing in front of right now to be reminded through his word that this is God's situation God is still in control. And so therefore, let us not be fearful. Let us not be wavering. Let us not become discouraged. But let us look to this example which has been laid out in the scriptures before us. Let us be living epistles to all that see us. So this morning, I'm winding up here. Sorry if I've gone over, but many of us 
I'll say again, are facing seemingly impossible situations. Not knowing if we're going to make it. Not sure where the resources are going to come from. Not being able to even comprehend how or how or when God would deliver us. We may be facing a health diagnosis. We may be dealing with wayward children. We may be facing financial impossibilities. We may be facing problems with a habit that needs to be broken. Let me remind you yet one more time. With God, all things are possible. He's the same yesterday, today, and he will be forevermore. Now let me ask you this. Because we know in verse 4, in uh, chapter 4, after they have successfully gotten across, a representative from each tribe placed a stone in the river. They made a memorial. And this memorial, memorial was to, and every time, the, the, this Look at verse 6. This shall be a sign, chapter 4, verse 6. This shall be a sign among you that when your children ask later, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When they crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off so that these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. We need to memorialize God's greatness in our lives. We worship God for who he is. We remember God. We recognize God for what he does. But you see, when we remember who God is and what he's done for us, that is then reminds us when we come to the next big river or we come to the next big battle, we know that by looking at this memorial then, what he's already done. It be let, let, let me tell you, let me just tell you this. As you begin to build your landmarks, you look back to them. It becomes easier and easier and easier to step into the next challenge. You know? That's right. If you before had to depend on God to provide for your survival, and he did, then you can look back on that when you come to the next challenge, and maybe it's your health. Well, I don't know anything about this health situation that I'm dealing with, but I know in years past, he's always and he has never failed to provide my physical needs. This is that memorial that I'm talking about. And after you conquer that, you have him being your provider, you have him being your healer. Now you wonder, how am I going to maintain my walk. Well, I look back and I know that he provided for my physical needs. I look back and I know that he addressed my health situation. He must certainly be able to help me navigate through the spiritual minefield that I'm walking through. Regardless of what it is, brothers and sisters, let us keep in mind what we have learned here in Joshua. We are dealing with a God who supernatural is what's natural to him. Amen. Things impossible are possible to him. So how then should we carry ourselves as the children of God following his presence? Do we despair? Do we give up? Do we revert ourselves back to behaviors and, 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 and actions and words that defined us before we, we were in Christ? No. So Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that your words just take a firm, firm, firm root in the soil of our souls. As we deal with various situations and various circumstances, let us remember that with men things are impossible, but with God all things are possible. 
We thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your encouragement this morning. We continue to seek your face, Lord, and continue to admit, submit ourselves to be conformed to the image of Christ. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.